Good morning. Good morning, church. It is uh, good to be with you today. Um, for those who may be new, my name is Jonathan. I'm on staff here at the church, and it is good to see you, uh, good to see everybody here. Uh, last week, I, I was at a church preaching in Brooklyn in Spanish, so if I start to speak in Spanish, just give me a sign. <laughs> Please bow your head with me. Lord, I thank you for all that you do. We know that you are good and that you are kind, and I pray that you may be with us today. May we hear from your word, may it be true, and may you pierce through to our hearts and minds. In your son's name I pray, amen. So I'm not sure how many C.S. Lewis fans are in the audience, but one of the books that I remember the most from the Chronicles of Narnia series is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I can remember when I was in fifth grade, uh, our teacher would read the book to us, and there's a particular scene that stood out to me. It was when the armies of the Narnians and the witch are fighting. And Aslan, the creator of Narnia, had let himself be killed by the witch, and the Narnians started to become discouraged because they were losing the battle. At the very end, when they are so discouraged that they try to retreat, but then the resurrected Aslan comes with an army of people to defeat the witch and her army. The armies of Narnia go from being discouraged to experiencing victory because Aslan came to the rescue. Now, something similar to that happens in Acts 18, which is where we would be today. And just like the Narnians were discouraged and ready to give up, we see Paul discouraged and ready to give up. And last week, Pastor Caleb preached on Acts 17, where Paul is in Athens and preaches the gospel to some of the most brilliant minds of that time. And now we find Paul in Corinth meeting new friends, preaching the gospel, and also becoming discouraged. And this is probably the only chapter in the Bible where we see Paul about to give up. And what we will see in this chapter is how through Paul's life and discouragement, God orchestrates everything so perfectly, first to care for the soul of Paul, and then to pave a way for the proclamation of the gospel. And what we will see in, is God's intentional providence in the life of Paul. So let us read Acts 18, 1 to 17 together. And the Word of God says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy. Shout out to all the Italians in the room. With his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And when he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. And from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in the city, in the city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to complain. A matter of questions and names about your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So to help, you, to help work through this passage, I have laid out for you guys three points. Point number one is Paul's fellowship. Point number two is Paul's encouragement. And point number three is Paul's protection. And I do have three short application points at the end. But before we get into our first point, I do want to give you some historical context that will help to put this chapter into perspective. Perspective. 
Corinth is located in what we would call to today southern Greece. And back then, Greece was divided into two provinces. One was Macedonia, and the other was Achaia. So Corinth was actually the capital city of Achaia. So to put it in perspective, Corinth would be similar to what Manhattan is to the state of New York. And one thing about the geography of that time was that Greece was heavily fortified by mountains that were difficult to travel and was surrounded, and Greece was also surrounded by the ocean. And according to one commentator, nowhere in central or southern Greece can a person travel more than 40 miles from the sea. And because of the rough terrain of Greece and the easy access of water Corinth had, the city of Corinth actually became and was at that time the main port of trade in that province. And instead of traveling and trading by land, having to travel that rough terrain and several hundred miles, people would get to the, it made it much easier for people to transport by, by trade, by sea. And that made Corinth into a major city that was very wealthy and very rich. And, when, and what comes with major wealth is a lot of sin, which is why Corinth was also known for its very sexualized culture which Kent Hughes says the Corinth was the vanity fair of the ancient world. And usually when you have a place that has a lot of money, you have a lot of, you have a sexual, sexualized culture, you have greed, you have indulgence, and so forth. And you can look at Corinth like an ancient Las Vegas or New York City. And this is why when Paul writes to, the first, to first Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, he rebukes them for their conduct. And it is also at this time that Paul is in Corinth that he writes First and Second Thessalonians, just a little nugget of information for you there. And with that being said, let us look at our first point, Paul's fellowship. So what we see in Acts 17, after Paul is preaching in the Areopagus, and he leaves Athens and travels about 40 to 50 miles to get to Corinth, it so happens that when he gets to Corinth, he meets a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And if you are familiar with the New Testament Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned six different times in four different New Testament books. And this couple became very important in the life and the ministry of Paul. And what we glean from this text is that this couple were Jewish and that they had been kicked out of Rome by the Roman Emperor Claudius in 49 AD. Um, He expelled all the Jews from the motherland, which Aquila and Priscilla were one of those couples. And it is unsure if this couple was a Christian when they met Paul. Some scholars think that they were. Other scholars think that they weren't. But either way, this, this is God's providence in the way that he would care for the Apostle Paul. And when I use the word providence, what I mean is God's intentional guiding hand and circumstances. So this is what I think is happening. Paul goes to Corinth, and keep in mind that at this time there's probably no, there is no church in Corinth. And Paul gets there by himself since he is waiting for Timothy and Silas to get to him. And he meets this Jewish couple that are probably not familiar with Corinth, and the Lord puts Paul and this couple in each other's way. So have you ever gone to a place where you're not familiar with anything there or anybody there, and then you meet that one person that you have something in common with, and then you immediately become attached to them because there's some form of common ground? That is what is happening here. Providentially, Aquila and Priscilla get kicked out of Rome. Providentially, Paul leaves Athens to go to Corinth, and then they providentially meet each other and are knit to each other. And not only did they have common ground over not being familiar with Corinth and being of Jewish background, but the Bible also says that they were tent makers like Paul was. Now, it was a custom of Pharisees of who Paul used to be to have some type of trade to be able to sustain themselves, and Paul's trade was tent making. Now, usually when Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned in the Bible, Priscilla's name is mentioned first because scholars believe she was a wealthy woman with some type of high status. So it is very probable that this couple, went when they got to Corinth, they had enough money to start their own business. And because Corinth was a commercial city, they probably had a very prosperous business. And this was, they were entrepreneurs who took something that they knew how to do and made it into something that would generate revenue. And the Bible says that Paul stayed with them and he worked. And when Paul got to Corinth, he probably didn't have anything else besides the clothes on his back. He probably didn't have food to eat. He probably had only a few bucks in his pocket. And because Corinth was a very expensive commercial city, he probably couldn't afford an apartment there. So one of the important factors that came out of meeting Aquila and Priscilla was that Paul obtained a job 
where he would be able to make a living until he got sufficient money to go back into full-time ministry. And that means that Paul was probably working as a tent maker with Aquila and Priscilla six days a week. And as verse 4 says, Paul would go into the synagogue and that he would preach Christ to the Jews and to the Greeks. And Paul, in this instance, is operating as a bivocational minister. And Paul does not want to become a burden to people by just freeloading off of them. But Paul is working with his hands. He is toiling and he is laboring six days a week to be able to sustain himself, to then be able to preach the gospel to the Jews and to the Greeks on the Sabbath. Now, please don't hear me saying that it is bad to take a day off. Uh, That is not what I'm saying, nor do I think that's what the text is saying. But one thing we should examine is what caused Paul to have the resilience and the discipline to be able to work tirelessly in the trade six days a week and then on his day off to preach the gospel. In the past chapters that have been preached, what we see is constant trials and struggles in the life of Paul. So Paul has a lot of battle scars, both physically and spiritually. But what kept him going? And I think the answer to that question is found in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 to 14, where Paul says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what, be- what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, and I press on towards the goal for the upward goal, upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul knows very well that his life would be meaningless if Christ would not have saved him. And because of that salvation, Paul forgets what lies behind and continuously presses forward of what is ahead because of the gospel. What you see in the life of Paul is someone who has been deeply changed by the power of the gospel. Someone who went from persecuting Christians to them being persecuted. And Paul's life drastically changed as the equivalent to someone being hit with a tractor trailer. They will never be the same again. And Paul was hit with the gospel he was, that's why he was able to travel into an unknown city where he didn't know anybody or anything to be a testimony of the life-changing effects of the gospel. And what was at the for, uh, forefront of Paul's mind is that which he told the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul lived by this code, to live for the one who has saved him, to spend his life for the one who died on the cross for him, and to keep pressing forward until the, di- until the day he would close his eyes in this world and he would wake up with his eyes fixed on his Savior. Brothers and sisters, are you pressing forward? Are you forgetting what lies behind and pressing towards the upward call of, Christ, of God in Christ Jesus? Would you be able to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Or are you stagnant, worried, and anxious about the cares of this world? The beautiful thing about this is that Paul was not pressing forward on his own. God had providentially provided fellowship for Paul, for Paul through the fellowship of the friendship of Aquila and Priscilla. So he worked with them by night, six days a week. And then every day he would go home and he would have dinner with them. And then at night that he would keep on being with them and he would uh, fellowship with them and read the Bible with them probably. And he had immense fellowship when he, was, when he met this couple. He not only gained a job, he also gained new friends. He gained a new brother and sister in Christ. And through the time that Paul was waiting for Timothy and Silas to get to, the, get to him, he worked. He had a job. He had everything that he need, needed. Paul was probably not expecting this when he got to Corinth, but God provided it. Friends, sometimes God provides for us in ways that we may not be asking for. Paul needed food, he needed clothes, he needed money, but instead of providing, providing those material things, he provided a job which would, he, which would enable him to acquire those things. But through all of it, Paul was faithful in pressing forward in his mission and proclaiming the gospel because Paul knew that God's timing and providence is perfect, and he did what he could with what he had, and he was faithful. And God perfectly provided for Paul in every circumstance, and just like he did with Paul, he does with us. Now, if you are asking the Lord to provide you with something, please remember that what we are looking for is not always what we need. But God perfectly provides everything we need in the perfect timing of when we need it because God is sovereign. He does everything that he pleases, and he knows how to care for his children. Now, finally, in verse 5, we see that Timothy and Silas get to Corinth, and it was only after they got to Corinth that Paul was able to dedicate himself back to full-time ministry ministry. 
This was probably because Timothy and Silas brought some type of offering gift to Paul, most likely from the Philippian church. Uh, we see that in Philippians chapter 4 or 5 and 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. But it seems like this gift offering was enough for Paul to leave his 9 to, nine to 5 of making tents and devote himself back to full-time ministry. But more than money, Paul now had his two trusted sidekicks who were able to carry the load of ministry with him. Now, it is encouraging to see how the Lord provided for Paul new friends. He provided a job. He provided, instead of um, giving him his old friends, he, got, he gave him new friends, and then he gave him back his old friends. And God indeed provided everything he needed to preach the gospel, and, to, and in his circumstance, Paul was grateful. He thanked God for everything that, that he had given him. But in the same text, what we see is a side of Paul that is only present in this text, which leads us to our second point, Paul's encouragement. Now, the following scenes from verses 6 to 11 are the main point of today's text. We will see many different ways uh, in which Paul was discouraged, and we will also glean from the text some possible reasons he was discouraged. So let's walk through this to see what, what was taking place. So after Paul is able to leave behind his 9 to 5, Paul begins to teach in the synagogue more often. And what we see in this verse is similar to what we see in many other chapters in the book of Acts. When, when Paul speaks to the Jews, they revile him, they dismiss him, or they try to do some type of harm to him. And usually Paul just brushes it off and he just keeps on doing what he's doing. But in this verse, we actually see Paul become discouraged. And it says in verse 6, And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So what we see in this verse is Paul actually throwing in the towel when it comes to preaching the gospel to the Jews. And he pretty much wipes his hands clean and says, you know what? I tried to preach the gospel to you. I tried to bring you the good news. I tried to labor for you. But you know what? No more. I'm tired of this. Up until this point, Paul has dealt well with rejection. But here we see that he's done being rejected. His soul is tired of putting in the work of evangelizing and being turned away. He is weary of giving the message and being turned down. In our first point, we talked about how passionate Paul was and about writing to the Philippians for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. But a few verses later, we see Paul become discouraged. And that goes to show that even the great apostle at times became discouraged. The fact that he was apostle did not take away the fact that he was human, and as humans, we are very fragile. If Paul, if Paul felt discouraged, then we should not be surprised when discouragement creeps up at our door, lingering and waiting to take effects in our hearts. And maybe you even sympathize with Paul. Maybe you have been preaching the gospel to your friends or to your family members or to your neighbors or coworkers, and at the mention of the gospel, they immediately turn you down. And maybe you come to a place where you have been rejected so much where you refuse to open up your mouth again because you just are tired of being rejected. I mean, the Bible literally says that Paul shook out his garments, and he says, I'm done with you. He says, no more. And maybe this is you today. But I encourage you to keep on listening. Wait and see how the Lord responds to Paul in this instance. Then after Paul gets mad at, at them, in verse, verse 7 says, he goes to the house of a man who lived next. How ironic is that? that was, that's like if I were to get mad at you guys, and then I would walk over to my apartment next door and then start a church over there. Uh, the, the people, but Paul is like, you know what? If you don't want to hear the gospel, I'm going to go right next door to where they want to hear it. And the people next door, they welcome Paul. They were like, yo, you got the message of the good news? Come and teach us and preach, it and preach to us. Tell, it, tell us what it means, what it is to be saved. And Paul did. He went and he preached that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life in conformance to the law of God. And because Jesus lived a perfect life, he was a perfect sacrifice and gave his own life on the cross. And that, on the third day, he rose again. He preached a message of saving faith to them. And ironically enough, this guy named Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, actually got saved along with all of his family members. And on top of that, the Bible says that many Corinthians believed and were baptized. And praise God for that. We see the start and the rise of the Corinthian church. But I do want to dig in a bit deeper into Paul's discouragement. Nowhere else in the Bible do we have Paul being so discouraged that he gives up. From all the times, from all the things that he writes in his epistles, usually he's like, you know, God's power is made perfect in my weakness. 
or we felt like we received a death sentence, but that was to make us rely on, not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And we have moments in the Bible where, when Paul went through discouraging moments, but his faith was always unwavering in God. But I do believe that what we see in this text is different. I think Paul was severely discouraged. And I mean, he pretty much tells the Jews that he's done with them. And even though Paul is still preaching the gospel, I think inwardly Paul is wrestling with whether he should stay or he should leave Corinth. And Paul is at a breaking point. He throws in the towel. He received that last blow in the fight that knocks him out. He raises the white flag signaling that he has given up. And Paul says, I don't want this anymore. I'm tired of the same old thing. And the reason I glean that is because in verse 9, Paul has a vision of the Lord telling him, do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. Now, why is it that Paul is so discouraged? What was different about this time than all the others? What were the main factors of Paul's discouragements? Was Paul discouraged because of what happened back in chapter 17? It's possible that Paul was discouraged that he had been pushed out of Thessalonica because people there didn't want to hear what Paul had to say. And the fact that Paul and Silas had to be sent away by night probably was because there was a green light on their lives to kill on sight. And maybe Paul was discouraged because when he got to Berea and finally found noble Jews that were open to the message of the gospel, he had to leave again because the Jews from Thessalonica came looking for him. Or maybe he was discouraged because he didn't find as much results in Athens as he would have liked. Was Paul discouraged because he was rejected by the Jews? Well, even though Paul gave up on the Jews, it is evident that when he went to the Greeks, people were being saved and people were being baptized. That still doesn't take away the fact that Paul was discouraged from being rejected. If you try to be friends with someone and they reject you, but another person takes you in, that doesn't take away the hurt from the first rejection. Was Paul discouraged because he was feeling how hard ministry is? So before being working part-time here at the church. I used to work as an aircraft mechanic. I used to work on helicopter engines, jet engines, aircraft components for a military contractor. And there have been moments where I ask myself, should I keep being in ministry? It was easier working on helicopter engines because there were no complex emotion or sin issues that took a long, a long time of prayer and, and counsel and Bible investigation to fix. Most of the problems in the engines I faced could be fixed with just ordering a new part or isolating the issue and troubleshooting it. I would go in, I would do my job, I would do my thing, I would build these engines, I would test these engines, and then I would, at the end of the day, I would clock out, I would leave, and then I would leave, I live my life. But being in ministry is a job that you can't really clock out from. Your life has to be a constant example to others, and if someone calls me for counsel, I can't just say, sorry, I'm off the clock. But as ministers, we are called to live a fully devoted Christian life that we are in day in and day out. And maybe in the back, and part of me feels that Paul is feeling this. Maybe in the back of his mind, Paul is like, you know what, I should just go back to tent making. You know, maybe I should just go back to, to a regular nine to five where I can just make these tents who don't talk back to me or don't hit me. And it's possible that Paul was just contemplating leaving ministry to do a regular nine to five. He's like, do I really need this? Do I really need to be treated like this? Now, this text is not 100% clear on the reasons why Paul was so discouraged. But I do think for sure that one of the causes of Paul's discouragement is that Paul had been through so much that he did not want to go through another uprising or another beating. And if God is telling Paul not to be afraid and not to be silent, it is because Paul is afraid and he is discouraged. And Paul has been severely wrestling with discouragement and fear that has knocked him off his feet. And if God is telling him this, it's because he sees it in the depths of Paul's soul. God knows the depths of who we are. And no one can hide the deep feelings of our soul from God. Psalm 139, 1-2 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up and you discern my thoughts from afar. Now, even though Paul didn't say it out loud, God knew the depths of Paul's soul, of his heart and his mind. And he knew the deepest thoughts of, of what he was thinking, which is why he saw that it was needed to remind Paul that he was still with him. And friends, how good is it to have a God 
who knows all things. To have a God who knows the most profound thoughts of our hearts and minds. And even though others may not, might not see it, God sees it. And he searches and knows us intimately. Not one thought is hidden from his sight, but yet all is laid out before him. And he knows when to remind us that he is with us. So when I was in high school, I used to get into a lot of fights. And by fights, I mean physical fights. Uh, sometimes I look for them. Many times they came looking for me. Uh, and this was before I was saved. But how many of you here have actually been in a physical fight before? All right, now we know who the brawlers in the church are. So a lot of you will know what I'm talking about when I say this. Being that I have been in fights before means that I have been punched in the face on multiple occasions. Now let me tell you about this. It is not fun when somebody's knuckles hits you in your face or hits you in your eye and gives you a black eye or hits you in your nose and your nose starts bleeding or hits you in your mouth and then busts your lip open. It is not fun. I even got hit with a bat one day, which is probably why I'm a little slow. Some of you are asking why I am the way that I am. There is your answer. You know, something up here got loose. But it's, that's just someone's fist. I cannot imagine what it feels like to be hit with a stone or with a rock. These are heavy and dense and solid objects. And in Acts 14, it says that Paul was stoned, meaning that he wasn't just punched in the face by somebody. He was hit in the face with a stone. He was hit in, with his, in his body with stones. And it says that they stoned him so bad that they dragged his body outside of the city because they couldn't tell that he was still alive. If Paul was a good-looking dude before, not anymore. This is how bad they had beat him. And in Acts 16, a crowd of people beat up Paul and Silas with rods in which the Bible says that they had inflicted many blows upon them. And they were thrown into prison and they were probably put in a position that, were, that caused them much pain and probably for their injuries to become worse. And in Acts 17, Paul is forced to leave Berea because Jews were coming to persecute him. And Paul was forced to leave by himself because they would not leave him alone. And then he comes to Corinth trying to preach the gospel. And Paul sees the same signs he has seen before. Jews who want to harm him. And he has enough. Paul in Acts 18 is probably still trying to recover from all of the injuries that he has received from before. There is no doubt in my mind that this man has some form of uh, disability with the amount of times that he was beaten and treated. And I think that because of this, Paul is afraid. He sees the warning signs of something similar happening. Him being beaten and run out of the city. So he is wrestling whether he should stay or not. And he is probably thinking, there is no way that I can survive another beating. There is no way for my, that my body would be able to handle something else like this. And that is exactly why the Lord draw near to Paul in that moment. Because deep down inside, Paul had had enough. He did not want to continue. His spirit was heavy and it was burdened. And he did not know what to do. I can imagine Paul hiding under one of the tents that he had made, just reflecting on his sufferings and his trials. But God, knowing this, providentially meets Paul where he is and says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. God providentially encourages Paul. And the fact that the Lord comes and intervenes in the life of Paul in this way, encouraging him, says a lot about how discouraged Paul was but it also says a lot about how much God cares for the soul of Paul. This encouragement from the Lord is enough for Paul to get some air in his lungs and for him to say, I can do this because God is with me. This this encourages him so much that he stays a year and a half later in Corinth preaching the gospel. This providential encouragement was not only for the well-being and the care of Paul's soul, but also for those people God, that God had elected to save in the city of Corinth. God told Paul, for I have many people in this city. And when Paul got discouraged from preaching the gospel to the Jews, God said, don't be silent. Don't keep the words of the gospel tied shut. Open your mouth to speak the truth of the gospel. And even when you don't feel like it, even when you feel tired and you feel rejected, keep on preaching 
Keep on proclaiming. Keep on opening your mouth to evangelize. And God providentially encourages Paul so that he can proclaim the gospel to those he had called by his own providence. But brothers and sisters, I'm not sure where you, where you find yourself this morning. Maybe you find yourself deeply discouraged like Paul was. Maybe you are questioning everything that you have been doing up until this point. Or maybe you are discouraged in the ministry that the Lord has given you. Maybe you are discouraged from family members that keep you at a distance. Maybe, just like Paul, you receive a blow that knocked you off of your feet and you don't know how to get back up. And maybe you just received news of a bad medical report. Maybe a loved one just recently passed away. Maybe you have been like Paul trying to preach the gospel to your family members and friends and they just keep on rejecting you and you're just tired of the same old thing. Maybe you had circumstances in your life that knock you down and when you try to get, uh, when you try to get back up, another one comes and knocks you over again. Whatever it could be, you find yourself deeply discouraged and afraid, wondering what to do. I want to remind you and I want you to hear the words that the Lord told Paul in the midst of his discouragement. He says, do not be afraid, for I am with you. He says, do not be afraid, for I am with you. No matter what the circumstances are, do not be afraid, for I am with you. No matter how bad the situation looks, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I am not sure what hymns or songs were circulating that time, but I am sure that if Paul knew the hymns, it is well with my soul, he would have been singing it to remind him of God's goodness. And the hymn says, When peace like a river attendeth my way, and when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet and though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and he has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, all oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. And the Lord haste the day when my faith shall be sight, and the clouds should be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. The Lord promised to be with Paul because Paul had believed in the power of the death of Jesus and his resurrection. And Paul was washed by the blood, which is why God drew near to him. And when we hear the words of the Lord saying, do not be afraid, for I am with you, may we be able to respond, it is well with my soul, because Christ has redeemed us. Now, God promised to protect Paul, which is our last point and shortest point by far, which is point number three, Paul's protection. Now, eventually, after some time of being in Corinth, the Jews tried to form an attack on Paul. And remember the historical context in the beginning? Greece was divided into two provinces, Macedonia and Achaia. Well, this guy mentioned here, Gallio, was the proconsul of Achaia. Uh, pretty much he was like a modern mayor or governor of that time, of that province. And the Jews bring Paul before this governor, and they try to tra trap him like other Jews in other chapters of the Bible. Now, something interesting about the Roman Empire and its governmental system is that when Rome would conquer people or places, sometimes they would allow people to keep their religion. They would allow people to keep worshiping according to their convictions. It was a way for them to try to mitigate the control that they had attained over the people that they had conquered. But the religions first had to be approved by the Senate. The Judaic religion was one that was approved and recognized by the Senate, so the Jews were able to still worship freely, and they were still able to live their lives according to their convictions. Only that the governors would generally not get involved with the matters of a people's religions. So the Jews go to this guy, Gallio, and they plead their case before him that Paul has broken the law, and specifically, they say that he has broken, this man is persuading people contrary to the law. And God used this phrase to persuade Gallio not to get involved in what was happening. Because Gallio pretty much said, I will not get involved in any religious laws that do not 
particularly, particularly pertain to Rome. Now, there's two observations about this guy, Gallio. One, it is clear that the one, reason, one of the reasons he did not get involved was because he knew that the Judaic religion was one that was approved and really he had no jurisdiction in judging Jewish law. And secondly, I think Gallio really didn't care. You know, he, he didn't bother asking what, uh, what about the Jewish law Paul had broken. And he pretty much just dismissed the case. And on top of that, Jews, for some reason, jumped the ruler of the synagogue, Sosthenes, right outside of the tribunal. And why they jumped him, I don't know, probably because he failed to indict Paul. But the fact that he, jumped, that he got jumped right outside of the courthouse of the tribunal and nobody did anything. Like if we were to look into the parking lot right now and we saw somebody get jumped, you know, we would send our two biggest guys out there. We would send Steve Schultz and Dave Baldwin. And as soon as they saw these two big guys, they would get scared, they would leave, and then everybody would just go about their day. I am sure that Gallio knew that something was happening. You know, one of his guards had to be like, yo, Gallio, this guy's getting jumped outside. Shall we do anything? He's like, nah, just let it, just let it rock. Let it happen. And th but this is a very important event that happened for Christians. The fact that wrote the Roman governor knew about Christianity and probably knew that Paul was a Christian and completely dismissed the case paved the way for Christianity to have a legal precedence among the Roman Empire. God used Paul in this instance to set up the pillars of Christianity before the Roman government. And the fact that Gallio found that no law was broken was probably was because Christianity was rising as one of those religions to be approved in the land, which means that Christians will be able to worship freely. But all that to say that every single bit of this, if you look closely, you see God's providential hands of protection over the life of Paul. It doesn't matter the reason that Gallio, Gallio did not get involved to indict Paul. What matters is that God fulfilled his promise to Paul that he made in verse 10, in which he says, no one will attack you to harm you. He promised to protect Paul, and he providentially does. Why? Because God is faithful in fulfilling his promise to protect his people. God, the sovereign ruler of the world and the universe, is watching over his people. We can sleep in peace, we can wake up in peace, we can live in peace because we know that we are being sheltered under the Most High. The Lord is our refuge and fortress, and who can penetrate that? If we trust in the Lord, he will providentially protect us, and even after we pass away, our souls will be protected because we will be with the Lord. Now, I do have three short application points for you today. Application point number one, fellowship with the local church. Paul left by himself to go to Corinth, and even though, even though there was no existing church in Corinth at that time, God provided fellowship for Paul through the friendship of Aquila and Priscilla, and also through Silas and Timothy. Now, this is because fellowship is of great importance in the life of a Christian. Even though Paul was an apostle, he did not live a lone wolf Christian life. He lived in the midst of many companions of brothers and sisters and friends that believed in Christ. The only moments he spent alone were ones that he was providentially hindered, like being in jail. But friends, we are blessed that we have a local church filled with 115 members where we can have a fellowship galore. I encourage you all that on Sundays, do not just rush out, here, out of here as soon as the service finishes. Now, there's a reason when I'm standing back there at the, at the back of the church, I kind of stand in the way, in the door, not just because I want to be rude, I just want to talk. I want to stop people and talk with them and see how they're doing. And most people would probably not try to push me out this way, so that is my way of intentional fellowship. And to leave, you've got to go through me. And I, I do encourage you to all stay and to fellowship and get to know the people around you. Ask questions. How have you been? How is your walk with the Lord going? How can I pray for you? Do you want to meet up for coffee or come over for dinner? This way you can get to know the people that you have covenanted with. If you are single and young, I encourage you to seek out a family that you can serve and be a part of and get to know. Use your time in the body, even if that means making dinner for them or going out grocery shopping with them so that you can serve them while you fellowship. And families, take in these young singles or other single people into your homes and, and families. Um, invite, them over, invite them over for dinner. Invite them over for coffee. Invite them into the mundane of your life. I cannot tell you how much my life has been impacted with the amount of families that have taken me in and literally have made me part of their family.
And when I think about the Wolfers and when they invite me over all the time and they have invited me over for Christmas the past few years and I feel like now it's a tradition. Or with the Neglias, who Mike was my community group leader for four years and they made me part of their family and he taught me all about Star Wars. <laughs> or the Loverdes, who have me over all the time and have made me like another son. And each and every single family who has been in my life and who has invited me to fellowship Bob Walderman, who meets up with me every two weeks, or Jao, who is always willing to fellowship. There have been many people in this church who have taken me in, and I cannot tell you how much that has impacted my life. And I do believe much of the reason that I have been able to grow in the gospel is because I have had much fellowship around me. Now, I do encourage you all to do the same thing. It doesn't matter. They don't have to be single people. If there's a newly married couple and you have been married for, for years and years, take in that couple and disciple them. Or if you want to get together with other families that have kids, uh, get together, fellowship, get to know one another. We need each other. I encourage you all to do that. It is important for your life as a Christian to be deeply embedded in the life of your local church so that you can grow as a Christian. Now, one of the th um, application point two, keep on preaching. One of the things that discouraged Paul was being rejected by the Jews. But God told him, do not be silent, because he had many people in the city. God was telling Paul, I am with you, therefore go. Go and get those whom I have elected. Go get those whom I, have, who, whom I will call and draw near to myself when they hear the proclamation of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, if you have been discouraged because you have been rejected by sharing the gospel, the Lord reminds us here that we should not keep silent because God is with us. God has elected those who will come to him, and every person he elected will come to him in, in God's timing. But God commands us to be faithful and not to be silent, to, to keep on proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are around us so that he can open their eyes to the truth. So I encourage you, keep on preaching. And application point number three, trust God. What we see in this text is how God has providentially cared for the life of Paul by providing sustainment through work and giftings, through fellowship, through encouragement when he was down, and protection when they tried to do him harm. God intentionally orchestrates every single detail for the well-being of his servant Paul and also for the proclamation of the gospel. And just like he cared for Paul and provided for Paul is the same way that God provides for us and he cares for us. The theological truth that God is completely sovereign over every single molecule, over every single event, Sovereign over this world, sovereign over this universe, over all of all human history, should affect the way that we live our lives. When that theological truth of God's sovereignty lives at the forefront of our minds and hearts, it should produce a life of trusting God through every single circumstances of our lives, knowing that He is in control. He promises not to forsake us no matter what. And because He is sovereign, He promises that all things will work out for our good. Charles Spurgeon once said, God is too good to be unkind, and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. And Spurgeon hit the hit nail right on the head. And just to reiterate what he is saying, when you cannot make sense of the circumstances, you must trust the heart that is behind the one who sends them. Paul later wrote, to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. For we do not lose heart. And though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Church, do not lose heart. The weight, is glo the weight of glory is waiting for us. I encourage you all to trust the Lord. Trust that he has your best intentions in his heart, knowing that he cares for you. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us, but he is with us. Now, before I pray, I just want to say, if you have not trusted in the Lord as your Savior, or you have not repented of your sins, none of the sermon actually applies to you, but it can. If you have, uh, Christ said, all who come to me, I will never cast away. So if you come to Christ and you bow before him, 
all of the sermon can immediately, immediately apply to you. So if you want to know what it's like, how to be saved or what it means to be saved, I encourage you to come talk to me, come talk to any of the pastors, anybody here on stage or anybody around you. Acts, how can I be saved? Now let us pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that even though I am an imperfect vessel, I know that your, your word does not return void. And I pray that this may be that this reminder of, of your protection and of, your, of, of you encouraging us that you are with us may be with us throughout the week. Please help us to see more of your son, Jesus Christ. In your son's name I pray, amen.